My name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants. And today we have the honor and the privilege of meeting Lisa Smith, who is a licensed arborist and tree lover and very well known throughout the Los Angeles County. And we're so lucky to have her and her expertise in plant and specifically tree care. Lisa. Thanks, Charles. You're, You're very so welcome. sweet. <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about extremes extreme weather, wind, heat and how to protect your tree during those extreme events. And I've spent the last 24 years in Southern California um, inspecting trees, observing trees, and seeing what makes trees tick, and how to maintain them with the best management practices. So thank you again, Charles, for having me here today. I'm really excited, you have a fun group, and I know we're gonna cover some great stuff. You're very welcome, Lisa. And if anybody wants to reach out to Lisa, I'm gonna put in the comments below all of her contact information so you can reach out to her with any of your tree questions as well. Thanks again for watching. So last time I spoke with you guys, we were in the middle of a five-year drought. And I, all I talked about was the drought. It was how to maintain your tree, how to water your tree, what trees can tolerate the drought. And then lo and behold, we had the mother load of rain. And then we had r wind. Has anybody experienced any wind this year? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Charles called me yesterday morning and he said, you know, we're gonna do it outdoors. And I said, great. I don't have to rejigger my PowerPoint. I'm gonna be free form. I'm gonna be a free range chicken today. So I'm just gonna to talk to you about managing your trees during extreme events. And what does that mean? It could be extreme drought. It could be extreme rain. Mm -hmm. It could be extreme wind. And these are three things I wanna to talk to you today. And Charles, I think I'm like a perfect segue because he talked a lot about soil and soil is super important as we all know. And the health of your soil can dictate the health of your canopy. So when you have extreme events, whether it's extreme rain or extreme wind or even extreme drought, the soil health and vigor dictates the root health. And that root health dictates your canopy health. And everything starts at the roots. I know I take my probiotic in the morning and I'm trying to maintain good, good enzymes and all that. Well, roots need the same thing. So I'm gonna talk about three things, the soil, um, I had it in my mind. I want to talk about the soil, how you're going to water it, irrigation. I'm going to talk about mulch, my favorite topic, and we're going to talk about pruning for safety. So let's start with the mulch because I love mulch. And mulch, let me just tell you, I'm going to be quick about this. Mulch is your friend. Mulch is the most important thing that you can do for your trees because mulch has so many benefits. Now you're wondering, okay, what bag do I buy? Where do I get it? But I'm going to I'm going to break the rules and I'm going to tell you the best mulch to get is wood chips. And if you use a compost, that's fine. If you use a bark, that's fine. But you're not going to get the long-term benefits that you will from wood chips. And wood chips are actually in a, in, in a, in a, uh, in a form that is going to most benefit your soil. The way wood mulch, wood chips, break down is that they activate enzymes and they really feed those enzymes. So as the wood mulch is breaking down, it's creating all the nutrients into the soil and those enzymes create antibiotics. Isn't that crazy? Wood mulch creates antibiotics. Now what would we want to be preventing? Anybody have any ideas what we want to prevent? Mold, disease. disease. Mold, disease, disease. root rot, mm. stressed roots. So it's nature's way of protecting the roots. We have leaf litter. When you're in the woodlands, you see a branch fall and it decomposes. <laughs> it's creating those antibiotics. You don't find Phytophthora root rot and Armillaria malia, oak root fungus rampant in woodlands like you just have natural trees growing. Because it has that natural cycle, it's breaking down the leaves, it's breaking down the wood bark, the bark and the um, broken limbs, and it's breaking that down, it's creating a suppressant antibiotic. So we can do that in our urban environment. It's like, well, you know, I've got a big California pepper tree in my front yard. I have some smaller trees, some red buds and some other stuff. 
But I really dedicate the first, I have a 14 foot tree ring underneath my pepper tree because I know California pepper are susceptible to root fungus. root fungus is our malaria. Now I'm going to send a handout on our malaria to, and I may have sent it before to Charles, but I'm going to send you a collection of electronic PDFs and you guys can all have them. I don't mind at all. I have a whole bank of client, I call them client info sheets, and I'm more than happy to send the whole thing over. So then you can have those in your repertoire. And you go, what? Well, how did they describe that again? Or, you know, this is a lot of information to take in today from what Charles taught, what we're talking about here. So I want you to be able to go back and say, what are we talking about mulch? What are we talking about those diseases? So mulch, when you place down about two to three inches of mulch, you're actually creating a good blanket of protection for your roots. So any questions so far on that? Yes? Uh, is there a certain kind of mulch you don't want to get, like cedar mulch or? Well, I think I wouldn't get a colored mulch, and I wouldn't use a rubber mulch, and I wouldn't use a gravel mulch. I'm not a big fan of rocks and gravel underneath. Now let me back up for a second here, and when you have, say this circle right here is the tree's root zone, and the tree's, here's its trunk, and here's its root zone. Now, I'm a compromiser, so I tell people, if you can dedicate at least six feet from the trunk out with just mulch, that's great. Once you do your DG or your gravel or something inorganic, that's not going to be a well, DG. I mean, once you do something that's less of a mulch, you should do it further away from the trunk. Imagine all of the roots in the first six feet are what we call the CRZ, the critical root zone. Very critical because that's kind of like the core of the tree. The tree can lose the roots out there and the roots out there, but once it starts to lose roots right close to the trunk, that's when you're gonna to start to see stress in the canopy. So you really wanna protect that critical root zone. So if you're gonna do a mulch and you're like, I mean, I, I work with hotels and shopping centers and they're like, I can do two feet. I'm like, fine, I'll take two feet. You know, I'm, what can I do? But if best world, best, we call it BMPs, best management practices, those say, do as much mulch as you can as far out. Now, go ahead. I was gonna ask you what the best mulch is for roses. Um, you know, I'm not a rose expert, but I would say that if you're doing a, a bark mulch or a wood mulch, that's helpful. The, I'm glad you asked that though, because I was just going to say, you guys all know this. I'm gonna tell you something, I know you guys all know this. What should you not do with mulch? Right, don't put the mulch right next to the tree. Now let me tell you why. Because it holds moisture. Remember the mulch is good, it's gonna hold the moisture. Well, you don't want it to create a mulch volcano touching the trunk. So you don't want, you want that trunk to have a nice free, I mean mulch does not, I mean sometimes you get that in a woodland where mulch and leaf litter is falling next to the base of the tree. That's a natural environment. But the problem we have in our urban environments is we water more often. So also, if you have a juvenile tree, I see this all the time, people will plant a little tree, it's three, four, five inches in diameter. When they put that mulch very close, the little roots grow out into the mulch and they circle around. Now, 10 years down the road, that little root is now a big root and it's called a stem girdling root. Do you guys know about that? The stem girdling root? An SGR? You never heard of an SGR? <laughs> stem girdling root? <laughs> okay. Let me tell you, I could retire on lawsuits on stem girdling roots because, as you know, they cause trees to fall over. SGRs, imagine if you're like this, and we're going to talk about wind. Imagine you got a stem girdling root from when you were a little baby tree. Where else do you get stem girdling roots? Pots. 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 Yeah. Ding, ding, ding. They're, al they're alert over here. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine when you're buying a container and those roots are going round and round and round and you put it in the ground, what are they going to do? Are they going to go, oh, we can now grow outward. No, they just keep going in the same direction, round and round and round. And I'm going to tell you, you know, I, I've got so many stories I can tell you, but I'm going to tell you one because it's kind of interesting. It's a lawsuit. The woman was at Magic County, and she was sitting in the food park, and a Chinese elm tree just went 
and popped over and landed on her and hit her back. And she was injured pretty, pretty badly. So we come out there and literally the base of the, the trunk was like, imagine this is the tree in the ground. This is the tree in the ground. See that? It was just like that. The tree popped out and that was the base of the trunk. It had been girdled back to its old 15 gallon container size. Oh, I measured it. I was on the plaintiff side in this case, and I I'm, I'm do both sides of all kinds of work. But this was textbook stem girdling root, SGR, and how the industry practices from, from many years ago encouraged this problem. And it's only a matter of time before it becomes like a twisted sausage underground. And so I have in my storage unit, not only about that much of the trunk and showing it literally like this, and in that trunk is a big indent where a root wrapped around the entire base. And I made them dig out the whole entire root ball, which is like a beautiful bowl where that root, where that trunk was previously emanating out of. So now that's an extreme case. But I want you to understand why stem girdling roots are a problem, because they cut off the flow of water to the canopy, and they cut off the stability of the tree. And they inhibit the expansion of the base of the trunk, where you get that nice flare. Now, this goes back to mulch, because when you put mulch right up against the trunk, you're encouraging that. So I, I digress there for a second, but I wanted to the extreme in that example because it will remind you of that. And so anyway, mulch is so important. Mulch is going to protect you because when we have this heat that we're going to have all summer, mulch is going to be like a blanket. It you guys know this, I know, because you guys are all nodding like, yay, I'm glad to hear somebody else agrees. Mulch regulates the soil temperature. It helps with the exchange of gases. You've got gases coming out of the soil. You've got oxygen coming back in. If you have concrete, you're not getting oxygen. If you have rocks, you're not getting oxygen. Another thing that's driving me crazy is the weed protection fabrics. Everybody likes to put that down. Put weed protection fabrics in areas that you're walking, or you don't have a tree, or if you have like a garden and it's all little plants, little shrubs, don't use it for trees. Because that weed protection fabric does not allow exchange of gases. And you will find this, I have more photos than I care to, of where I'm looking at the tree and go, oh, my tree's sick. I go, hmm. I always look down. When a tree's sick, Charles knows this, you see something sick, what's going on with the roots? I pull back the mulch. Oh, lo and behold, there is a weed protection fabric. I go, you just smothered your tree to death. Because remember, that critical root zone is really important. So that critical root zone has now been suffocating for many, many years. When I pull that fabric back, what do I find under there? all these tiny fibrous roots and they're like help we need oxygen i mean they're literally suffocating and there's a woman a professor up in uh washington very very um well known travels the circuit and teaches and she talks about weed protection of fabric it's like taking a cloth putting it over your nose a wet cloth and trying to breathe through that that's what it is like for trees so don't use the weed protection fabric under your trees and I also teach at UCLA in the landscape architecture program. And when I teach my students, I tell them, there's lots of products out there. Doesn't mean they're good. Really be critical about thinking about it. And Charles is so good about explaining how you can be your own expert. You can look at the ingredients in an expert way. Like, don't just go, oh my god, it's on the shelf. I mean, I'm having battles right now with some products where I'm telling people, no, it's not a good product. And so we as consumers have to be more critical about it. And Charles brought that to light today when he brought the good and the bad. So to help you guys to understand that. Okay, so now we talked about mulch, the importance of that. Um, I want to talk about irrigation. And Charles mentioned earlier about watering. I want to say one phrase that you guys are now going to learn and you're going to just love it. Mimic rain. Go, that's my talk. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> exactly. After all that, mimic rain? <laughs> exactly. So, so, 
I have so many highfalutin designers and architects and they buy all these products, I go, just make it look like you're gonna mimic rain. And what does rain do? Rain comes, it percolates for a long, slow time, and it gets through the soil. Now, if you recall, when I was talking um, previously, a year and a half ago, during the drought, it was all about salt. We had so much salt in the soil, with this salt, and how are we gonna get the salt out, and what are the effects of salt? Now it's stressful, and it literally uh, does not allow the roots to pull up the ionic action, is not allowing the roots to pull up that water. So we were all advising to deep soak, to do a good deep soaking, and that can be 10 to 20 hours, like once a month. So I tell people to buy a soaker hose, they can serpentine it around and around and around, you know, out maybe seven, eight feet from the trunk, if it's a little tree less, if it's a bigger tree, maybe more. You can buy those soaker hoses and just turn it on a tiny turn. And I'm gonna send you my deep soaking handout, so you're gonna have that, and deep soak it. And as you're deep soaking and that water is percolating through, and some people go, you know what, I did it two hours yesterday, I'm gonna do another two hours today. I'm like, no, 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 no. You gotta do 10 to 20 hours one time because you're using this incredible physics of gravity. And that gravity is going to leach the salt. So you wanna get that salt out of the soil. Now, we had all this rain. So now we're like, well, the salt is gone. Okay, we're all good now, which probably is partially true. That rain we had this winter was excellent. It just made me so happy. We had a lot of a few days, which were a little intense. We were getting our rowboats out. But for the most part, the trees, as you can see, they are really popping everywhere. They look so happy. Their color is good. They're able to bring up those micro and macronutrients that they need. And the pH balance is better now. That salt is not changing that pH. So if you have a tree that's in an area where it needs a supplemental irrigation, if you have a species such as liquid amber, birch, plum, species that don't like the heat, or the, our salt, rather, um, do one deep soak a month. You, it won't hurt the tree. Now, even on oaks, people say, well, you shouldn't water oaks in the summer. And I'm like, no, no, no. It's, you can water oaks in the summer. Just don't water them all the time. If you do one time a month, like May, June, July, August, you're going to be fine. It's like a summer rain. That's what, what it's like. Big pines? What about the Thank you for that question. And you know, if you have any questions, just put your hand up. Because remember, I'm free range today. <laughs> so whatever questions come to mind, that's an excellent question. And you know, last summer I attended a class by a renowned researcher, Dr. Um, Francis Schwarza from Switzerland. And he taught here at the Huntington. And I took a three-day course on cellular makeup of trees and how they respond to decay. And pines are considered a prehistoric cellular structure, which means that they don't hold water. They're not like oaks where they can hold on to that water. They're not, they don't have a cellular makeup that really holds on to water as efficiently as oaks and other species like sycamore. So pines are, where are pines? They're normally in the mountains. We get all the snow, they get plumped up for the year, and then they continue growing. But with this extended drought, the tubes and the plumbing, I'm gonna say plumbing for the simple method, is just, is drying out. And then it causes a lot of cellular breakdown. So pines are very reliant upon deep soaking. If you have pines, you, and I'm gonna tell you, I can talk about so many different things, but pines are unique in that they give out pheromones when they're stressed, and many trees do that, but pines give out pheromones that bark beetle can sense. So bark beetle, and there's several types of bark beetle that attack our pines here in California, or Southern California. But they can sense the trees that are stressed. So they come along and they, they go, ah, that one, okay everybody, let's hit, to hit this one. Oh, that one in that yard is hydrated. It's not stressed, okay, let's go to this one. They are taken up prisoners. They know which tree to attack. So they go in, if they're the Ips beetle, they're gonna be in the tips, in the top. Like you see them on canary pines, where canaries are usually the pine that last um, is hit by the bark beetle. But because this drought has been so bad, if you're up in the valley and you're driving on some of the roads up in Northridge and you just see a whole row of canaries, canary pines, and they're just torched out. 
So pines, and thank you for that question, because pines are one that do need extra hydration. And remember, if it's a tall tree, you gotta really soak that tree to help improve that ability for that capillary action. And just a quick primer, as you know, when needles and leaves are hot, moisture is being pulled out. So that moisture is being pulled out, and that is pulling, pulling, pulling the water up from the root system. You guys understand that. That is just all transpiration that causes that whole action to pull the water to, the, to maintain the hydration. Well, as you know, if the tree's dried out in the roots, it's like here's needles up here and leaves and leaves and leaves and leaves and they're all transpiring. Well, the water's coming up and it's going to these leaves and it's going to these leaves. Oh, darn it, we ran out of water. Let's just get rid of the, okay, everybody, attention, memo to the tree. Let's sacrifice the top. And then the tree just says, we don't have the energy, we don't have the water, we're just gonna sacrifice the top because it's like hypothermia. The tree says, let's sacrifice the top and let's contract ourselves. We've gotta stay alive, everybody. We're just gonna keep these leaves down here. And that's what happens when you have just enough water to keep it alive, but not enough, enough to keep the whole canopy alive. You see that a lot of black walnuts. You see those black walnuts all in the hills here, they're all coming back. And where are they coming back? Not the tips, they're all coming back from the base. All that energy in the root system and the wood there is encouraging new suckers to come out. So, um, so the big picture with water is, what are you gonna do with watering? And what are you gonna mimic? Rain. 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 Rain, yes. <laughs> you guys are so smart. So, <laughs> so you're such good students. No. So um, yes. Are our DNRs uh, treated the same way as regular pines? You can, yes, and they're conifers. So DNR cedars, you can. You can deep soak them too, and they are sensitive. And there are bugs that are attacking them right now that are problematic. Some mites that have come up recently that are more problematic. So if you have a healthy tree, you're going to have less potential for a disease, less potential for bugs. You know, they know which ones they can attack. So yes, those so cedars for sure. Um, so the deep soaking, that's gonna be critical. And if you like, like I tell some clients, they wanna do, they have one or two or three real showpiece trees, they just buy a soaker hose, they just put it under the tree, they dedicate it, and they put the mulch on top then you don't have to see the soaker hose. You just put the mulch right on top, so it's pretty. So I tell people, you know, don't make it difficult. Don't make it rocket science. And let me just digress for a second here and tell you, did you want to ask I just want to ask a quick question. Yeah. Is that for citrus trees too? Well, citrus Same trees, goes for citrus trees. They're, you probably are watering more often with citrus, uh, yeah. Deep soaking? Yeah, you can, and not as long. Okay. Not as long. They're just a little more shallow rooted. They're smaller generally, right. you know, so you're going to be watering maybe in the summer, maybe once a week or every other week, depending on if it's in shade or sun, you know. And I always say, and everybody, Charles will agree, it's the, our joke saying is, it depends. You know, it's like, well, should I do? Well, it depends. So it's hard to be exact. Yeah, but getting out there, touching the soil. <laughs> what did you say? But like a doctor, like an MD. I know, well, sir. I know. <laughs> Here's your bill. <laughs> so, um, so citrus are a, a little bit of a different animal, and I have a citrus care handout in my oh, right. in my collection right. too. So I'll send that. Um, there is a product that yes, go ahead. I was just uh, going to say that. Don't you <coughs> agree that most people don't pay attention to trees? They're there and et cetera, et cetera, only until they go bad. Now, so, what is your remedy? Can I hug it, you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is a remedy when you see a tree? Hey, I got to do something. Is there a special on the deep soaking or a what? Again, it depends. It depends okay. on what the species is. Oftentimes, <laughs> see, I've done this so long. I'm like, what? What species? I'm like, oh, I know what it is. You know. Right. So it is really species specific. I see. So it's not always just watering. Although that is a good first question. Because I'll ask people, um, what species, where is it growing, like where in your property, send me photos of the base of the trunk so I can see the soil. And I want to see what their stress is that they're observing. Is it at the ends, at the tips? Right. That's going to be either two things, either drought, 
because it's given up those leaves, or root rot, oak root fungus. You're going to get that die back too. All comes back to water. Do much or do little. Yeah. Right. I know. And you know I don't know. I'm just No, you're thinking. right. And we unfortunately live in an environment. I was in Hawaii a year and a half ago with my family and we were in Kauai and walking around the hotel and I said to my kids, I said, and they're taller than me now, so I said, Look at this. No irrigation. I said, We they're just trying to manage the plants. And we were in the opposite position where we're trying to water, 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 water. It's all about water management. And to understand water management is really important, not only just for the health and vigor of our trees and our plants, but because it's so darn expensive now. You know, that you want to be conscientious, like, I don't want to overwater, I don't want to underwater, I want to just get it right, Goldilocks, you know. So, but you're right, people wait until the end, until, and I think the time of year is that you're going to find, or seasons that you're going to find the most stress, maybe when it's getting the hottest, you know, um, and that's going to be a good time to, that's going to push your trees to the edge, the end of the summer. So, um, the one last thing I was going to tell you about a product is this thing called a bubbler tube. Has anybody seen that, where it goes in the ground? It's like, imagine a vented tube, it's about four inches plastic. Have you seen this, Charles? Like a drain pipe. Yeah, it's like a drain pipe, four inches, and it's, and when people install a tree, they install that bubbler tube next to it, and inside is a little bubbler, and then they, they put a little cap on it. And the thought, brilliant concept, was that the bubbler will bubble down, and water will fill in there, and it will water the root ball. But they forgot about capillary action, and they forgot about gravity. So what happens is all the water just bubbles out at the bottom of the root ball, three feet down. And where, how do we want to water trees? Mimic rain. Mimic rain. <laughs> so, I've been on some huge projects where I'm like, I'm so sorry, but you're rotting your roots. And this is really bad. Throw this piece of you know what in the trash. I'm holding my language because I'm being videotaped. But, <laughs> but I really wanted to say something else. But, um, and also, because imagine, this is your root ball. This is your root ball. And pardon me for a second. Here's your bubbler tube here. And here's your bubbler tube here. And here is your trunk of your tree. Now, water is percolating here through the bubbler tube, and water is percolating here through the bubbler tube. How is the tree getting water here or here? All these roots die. All these roots die. People call me all the time, and I'm like, you can't water a brand new tree that way. You can't water any tree that way. That's not how God intended trees to be watered. I mean, it's kind of crazy. The majority of their roots, as you recall, maybe 80% of a tree's roots are in the top two feet. The most fibrous, young, absorbing roots are in the top 12 inches pretty much, where oxygen is, exchange of gases, nutrients, water availability, most fibrous roots, so they're watering down here. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at watering products, to just keep it simple. Don't even use the one that you press into the soil, you know, and you're gonna inject the soil. Just let gravity do its job. Anyway, okay, so that's my irrigation spiel. And then the last, not least, most complicated is wind. Our extremes, we've talked about temperatures, we've talked about rain, we've talked about watering. Now, how do we protect our trees from big limbs breaking, from managing wind? And this is like, I love this, because I'm a big advocate of understanding tree structure and tree dynamics. It's called the dynamics, the body dynamics of trees. And you're looking at a tree and you can go, I can tell that at one time it was doing this, and at one time it was doing that, and it grew with this going on. So you can look at a tree and see the history of it. And I love, that's a part of uh, tree science that I love. So I created this handout called Crown Reduction Pruning, and I'm going to describe it to you. And it's all about taking a canopy's load and not topping it. You don't want to top, but, and I'm going to send you my Crown Reduction handout, but taking it so that you're, you're taking those outer limbs and you may be bringing it back one foot, two feet, but where are you bringing it back into? Let me explain a little bit of tree dynamics is that when a tree is growing, every species kind of has their structure. You know, like oaks are usually kind of one trunk and then they grow branches off to the left and the right. Um, a pine is usually one central trunk that's called apical dominance and all the branches usually come out at a nice 90 degree angle. 
And then another extreme example are ash trees. And ash trees are usually one trunk, but then they branch out very tight, like a vase. And all those branches are very tightly, compactly congested. Now, so if you're a branch and you're coming out and you're at a 90 degree angle, there's two parts of the main wood that is developing. It's developing tension wood on the top, like a rope. It's holding that wood. It's developing tension wood on the top. And it's developing compression wood on the bottom. So this is a nice angle because you're getting kind of a nice amount of tension wood, a nice amount of compression wood. Compression is like a brace and tension is like a rope. So as that tree's branch gets longer and longer and longer, it can kind of hold that load. Sometimes you'll see a big oak tree and a big branch that comes out. It's just really big, beefy connection. And then it tapers and gets smaller and smaller and smaller. That's a proper attachment. So if you have a branch that's starting to get more at a tight angle, like an ash tree, how much tension wood do you have? Very little. Nothing's holding on this side. It's all the bracing. And when the tree is young, it's just a little wispy branch. But as it gets bigger and taller and longer, and you get the elongation of that branch, the, the, the bracing compression side of that branch can no longer hold on to that 30 foot long branch and just peels off. So branch attachments that are more 90 degrees are better. Now, we can't control every single tree. We can't say, you know, I'm going to straighten it out and make it go 90. It's not going to work that way. Some trees just have the DNA like an ash tree. It's just going to be a very tight union. So what I tell people to do is to take that lever arm, we call it lever arm, and shorten it. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to actually take the longest section and you're going to have little twigs coming off of that and you're going to take the longest section and you're going to bring it back into an interior branch and so you're going to allow the tree to still have that branch you're still going to have that attachment but you're shortening the load does that make sense yeah so that is an isa recommended method and i have been an advocate of this method for 20 years i learned about this from a dr ed gilman if you ever want to look up the best handouts Dr. Ed Gilman does tree wind dynamics. He's at University of Florida. He actually has, he has, he's written all the books on pruning, pruning of trees. And he has actually bought plane jets to mimic wind. And he does studies on wind. Now, one thing that people do often, I'm gonna tell you that's the thing to do to reduce chances of wind breakage. Because you're taking your entire tree and you're bringing in the load bringing in the load. It's all physics, you know. Now what would be a different way? Some people, inexperienced tree guys, go, well, I'm going to climb that tree and we're going to thin it out. The problem is they thin out all the branches. They never did anything about the ends. They still have those branches flapping around. And in the wind events, those will break. So they, they I call them chickens because I worked for 10 years in tree contracting. I worked for Valley Crest for 10 years. I put all the tree pruning programs together for a decade. And so I know firsthand, I work with the guys, and I know firsthand how they operate. So the guys who don't know what they're doing, they'll climb up in the tree, and they got their rope and saddle, and they've got their pruner or their chainsaw, and they're like, I'm gonna go out. I can't get out to the end, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna trim this, I'm gonna trim that, I'm gonna trim that. I'm going to trim that. Okay, look, it's so pretty. Okay, get back in the center. And then they go to the next one, and they just skin, and what we call gutting. They just gut that branch, and they leave a poof at the end. And they go to the next one, and they gut that one, and they leave a poof at the end. And then the homeowner goes, oh, isn't it pretty? It's all opened up. Well, that's not what trees like. Trees cannot manage load when they literally are all gutted like that. So what happens is wind event comes along and now the tree is flailing. And there's so many concepts I want to explain to you, but the other concept is that when a tree is full and has a lot of leaves, it actually can handle the wind. It's dampening, it's like this. It's doing a dance like this. Because all the branches are working together. All the leaves are dampening and buffering that wind event. <laughs> so oftentimes, sometimes ignoring your tree, they handle wind better. Yeah. So gutting the interior is, and I think you remember I mentioned this last time, is called lion's tailing. 
where you've got this long branch and then a poof at the end. And another long branch and a poof at the end. Do you recall that? The lion's tailing? And so what happens is they lost all of these interior branches and all you have is a, is a poof at the end. Now when you want to shorten that branch, where are your interior branches to prune back to? They're all gone. And all that's going to happen is that branch is going to stay skinny. It's not going to expand and taper and develop strength. So crown reduction, does anybody have any questions so far? OK. So um, um, crown reduction is very important because this allows you to have the ability to retain a tree you're nervous about or train your tree to be a smaller version of itself, sometimes if it's a big tree. Then, like we've even done that on the eucalyptus. We took that philosophy. We're like, the tree is great. It's a big tree. Don't be afraid of a big tree. But let's be smart about it. Let's not be silly. We can manage this tree. And so we brought in some limbs here. We brought in some limbs here. So now it still has a nice full crown. And so when wind comes along, it can hold that load. But it's not flailing about and becoming potential wind damage. Um, I feel like there's a question here. I'm sensing a question. Okay. We're, we're all in awe. Okay. <laughs> it's very, it's very I'm in love with your, your talk. Okay, okay. And I apologize, I don't have my hand because I have lots of great slides. I, I can see physicality is perfect. Okay, yeah, I can't help myself. Okay, good. Well, I just feel like that it just lends to the understanding of it. You know, I'm, I am the tree. So. Um, so, okay. The other point I wanted to make about when you gut the interior is you have in a tree a shoot to root ratio. The number of shoots are your leaves, and then you have your roots. So the roots are down there, and did you know the roots are the hormones of the tree? So industry standard is to never take out more than 25%. If it's an old oak, I may say 15 or 20 we we'll just kind of touch it now, and we'll come back six months, 12 months later, we'll touch it again. 25% is really the chemical limit that a tree's roots won't notice or won't respond. Now, when people gut a tree, they've taken out 30, 40, 50%. So what do the roots do? The roots go, oh my gosh, where are all our leaves? And they just say, okay, everybody, wake up. They chemically respond and tell the whole tree to wake up on the bark, on the trunk, at the roots, to grow more leaves. But they're not going to be beautiful leaves. Like, they're going to be pretty leaves, but they're not going to be appropriately located. They're called epicormic shoots, or sprouts, suckers, and they're going to be all over. And they're usually on the top, and they're going to be going up. So then you're getting all of these shoots within 12 months. So you just paid your guy a thousand bucks to trim your tree, and now you're right back where you were one year later. As my friend Dr. Ed Gilman says, the only thing that happened was an exchange of money. Um, and I agree, because you have not achieved any goal. When you prune, have a goal, and your goal should be number one, safety. You don't need to prune a tree. You really don't, unless you have a safety, or you're just trying to shape it or you're training it, you're making it, it's a young tree. But when they over thin that, you're actually creating more risk because that limb that is now lion's tailed is going all this weight and now it's twice as heavy as it was a year ago. Now where are you? Now you have to get the good guy to come in and do what's called restorative or corrective pruning. So this is really important that you don't hire people that want to gut the trees because they create more problems. So um, now, the, I'm so sorry. Oh, I apologize. Hold that thought. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in my meeting. <laughs> OK, can you have to get a ride? Can you get a ride? <laughs> I, I'm, I can't do them, just Uber. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, hon. I'm, I'm, yes, I think you should. Okay, you should. Okay, bye. Bye. <sighs> my work is never done. <laughs> That's my son. He's <laughs> This is my life. Welcome to my life. I know exactly. <laughs> he's, he's good, though. He's a good kid. Um, so, 
when you gutted the tree and now the tree is responding, um, the tree is responding because it lost all the first leaves. Guess what? When you do crown reduction at the tips, the tips, the tips, the tips, the tree doesn't notice. The tree doesn't respond. So you get more mileage out of your pruning. So see how smart I am? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I want you to have your money and your energy and your beautiful trees um, treated and managed in a way that's going to benefit you financially, benefit the trees, maintain safety, and be more intelligent about the management of your trees. What was so, the other word with restorative pruning? Or corrective. Corrective. Yes, yeah. So those are two methodologies when people do have a little bit of suckering going on from old pruning, they'll come in and they'll do that. I'm going to take out 30% of the suckers this year and maybe I'll come back the next year and take a few more out. I got a question. I just read, I'd like your comment on it. I read recently that they say if you have suckers, don't cut them, but tear them out so they right. die. Is that what, what yes. you're, you're cutting them, really? I well, mean, it's a funny thing. Tear it out. It, it's, yeah. Uh, I've I, never done that. But you need to catch them early if you're going to tear them. Uh -huh. And I agree with that. I have done that before. Really? Where you, if you can just, like on olive trees, right. they're, pro they're very prolific with suckering at the base. And But sometimes I tell people, which you brought up and I was going to just get into this, is when you're doing corrective pruning, I mean, we're getting advanced here. But if you're doing corrective pruning, and say you have this tree, and you've got really long limb, and you're like, dang it, I meant to bring that in, not you know, get all these suckers. What you can do is you can foster some of those interior suckers to now become branches. <coughs> and like on a sycamore, <coughs> sycamore, you know, they get pollarded in Europe. I mean, they're kind of a little bulletproof. So I have had clients go, you know what, I'm going to keep this sucker, and I'm going to keep this one, and I'm going to keep this one and this one, because I want to have a future interior foliage to bring that limb back to. Now here's a little caveat. When you do a reduction cut, you want to cut it back to a lateral that's one-third the size. So say I have a branch, and it's... Nine feet. Well, no, not the length. Oh, it's the oh. diameter. Oh. Yeah. So say the branch is where I want to make the cut is six inches in diameter. So that little lateral twig, I want to make sure it's two inches. It should be one third of the size. It's a chemical um, ratio that scientists have found allows callousing of that cut. Because it is a little bit of a heading cut, but you're reducing it. That reduction is back to a lateral. That lateral will now become the dominant. So, but it has to be a third of the size. Because I see guys, and they're in trees, and they're trimming a big six inch branch back to a little tiny quarter inch, one inch branch. That little one inch is not gonna make it. It has to be one third the size. And that's gonna be in my crown reduction handout. So you'll see that. And um, so this is a methodology that you can use for your big trees when you're trying to foster wind tolerance <coughs> and safety and retaining an old tree. Now you don't have to do this just because you think it's going to be windy. You could also say I'm going to do this because I don't want the tree to be any taller or I don't want to have the shade in that part of the day or it can be whatever your goal is. With crown reduction it could be I want to get it off my house. I want to get it away from the neighbor's house. I want to... You can use crown reduction on one side of the tree. So you can use that, that methodology in many ways. So. Um, with all the handouts you're going to be sharing with me, that I'll be sharing with all the ones that have RSVP'd with me because I'll have all of your email addresses, but how else can they get a hold of you sooner in case it takes a day or two and they want to reach out to you today? Like, do you have um, a, any business cards or phone yeah, numbers we should yeah, be writing down? Or, I, but on my, on my, um, my email I'll send you, it has all my info on there too. So Wonderful. you guys are welcome to shoot me an email yeah. if you have a question and you're like, do you know what that is? Or how do you, you know, I'm not... Doing, I'm not doing this to drum up business at all because I'm very blessed and busy, but I'm more than happy to help out with any questions. And if you do need me to come out, then I'll come out. Yeah. Yes. Lisa, I have a neighbor that just planted a, a palo verde right next to my wall. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just about a foot from my stairs going up. <clears throat> my friend has one, and I see them all over the city. Yeah. Because they, they grow quite quite large, especially the crown, it's really grown They can be. 
And this one is small, and I mean, it's going to be in my yard in another year. Yeah. Well, so you may I want mean, to discuss it with them and let them know that the, the canopy shape that it's going to be, that you want to make sure that they're able to train it or maybe move it. You know, that they need to be realistic with the future. You don't get a little puppy dog and then go, or, you know, a little pony and then go, here's your little place. You know, it's going to be a horse. Yeah. It's going to be a big dog. So they probably saw it at a nursery and said it was cute. And they installed it. <laughs> Pardon me? Say that last part? That's, that's it. Okay, yes. <coughs> Can you do the uh, restorative or corrective now, or is winter a better time? Well, pines and eucs you want to do in the cool winter. Pines and eucs you should prune in the winter. Other trees, oaks, are the summer. So if you've got oaks, this is the time, July through October, the heat. Citrus. Mm -hmm. citrus, if you've got a couple small cuts, it's okay as long as that cut maybe, but you want to keep citrus cuts small, like half an inch, an inch. Maybe Charles can weigh in on that, but they really don't like cuts that are large. They don't seal and callus and create that nice mm -hmm. donut ring of callus tissue very easily. So I always advise mm -hmm. people to be very um, conservative with uh, citrus cuts. Um, yeah. I'll weigh in. Um, so for citrus trees, generally the rule is not to prune your citrus tree at all, other than to correct in regards to shape. Yeah. Um, so if there's a branch that's going in the wrong direction, you um, correct that. Uh, but general practice when it comes to citrus, again, is no pruning. Um, and then again, in regards to pruning time, I like gauging it between harvesting the fruit, which is typically winter, and spring. So right in that window of time is my preferred time to prune being any other time of year, it's going to have small fruit or large fruit or it's going to be blooming. So I try to capture an opportunity between harvesting the fruit and before spring blooms. So right in that window. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. And this is about citrus too, and Charles knows our trees. We have some very old citrus trees, mm -hmm. and it does have dead wood. So I, 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 Charles, you've seen it and said we probably should trim that. Yeah, yeah when it comes to dead wood, yeah. there's, and for all trees, yeah. there's when no right or wrong time. It, yeah. yeah. it seems like they get yeah. a lot of fruit one year, and they'll go for a year or two with no fruit, yeah. and a lot of fruit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is they there a reason for that? You know, it's I'm not a citrus expert, but I have seen that cycling, especially in avocado. I see that. Right. You know, you'll get that every other year thing. Um, but you may want to monitor what you're doing right. as far as the watering. If there's one, yes. Now, if it's for you or Charles, is, is it uh, best if you don't eat all the fruit off of up an orange tree? I got some orange tree. It, it, is it okay to just leave it, leave the fruit on it, and let it drop, or should I harvest and get it off the tree? I so the there's two, two, two thoughts. One, by leaving it on the tree, you know you're going to have a longer life of enjoying the fruit. So, I mean, consider your tree your living refrigerator better than actually putting it in your refrigerator. Because once you harvest it, then you've got to enjoy the fruit typically within 10 days. Um, I've got lemons, for example, on my trees that I've enjoyed all the way from November. And here we are now in June, and I still have several dozens of lemons for the first time. I planted my trees three years ago, but I've enjoyed from November through now, and my family consumes on average one to three lemons per day for salad dressings, mostly marinades, and the occasional lemonade. Um, so when it comes to all this, uh, you know, harvesting your fruit, it's also a good practice to take them off. Like Meyer lemons, for example, those typically ripen in a very narrow window, and they don't last too long on the tree. So with all of my surplus lemons, I squeeze them into ice cube trays and store them in the freezer that way. Um, and by also taking off the load of the fruit off the tree, the tree will also have more resources to go into more bloom and supporting more young fruit. So it's the balance of all of these things. So when it comes to there's, it depends. It's, yeah, it depends, yeah. and you got to weigh these considerations Those are good in regards to, to squeeze and make nice yeah. cubes. And I like that. So nothing goes to waste. You can freeze them whole too, lemons, yeah. and then you grate them and put them on yeah. everything. Someone told me that. My too. husband freezes wine. Was it you? <laughs> <laughs> but then it'll. You know, <laughs> for the bar, yeah. <laughs> or cooking too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, the w one last thing I was going to mention to you is a totally non-related topic, but a very challenging topic. You may have heard about or read in the LA Times about our latest boar that's attacking all the trees, the polyphagus shot hole boar. Have you guys heard about that? What is it? Yeah. It's called polyphagus shot hole boar, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. But this is a insect that has been making its way through Southern California for the last uh, five to ten years, mostly really ramped up 
the last five years. It's I've been seeing it working its way across the 210 corridor. It's in Orange County, San Diego. It's made its way through Los Feliz, and it's around here, and now it's working west. I've seen it all the way west as far as Bel Air. So polyphagus shahobor, poly meaning many trees, it attacks a couple hundred species of trees, and it has a host availability in about 30 to 40 trees. So the big, the big species it loves is sycamore, the western sycamore. And what you'll see on it are these wet spots. Like you'll see where the insect has striked the tree and it has bored in. And what it's doing is twofold. It's always the female that goes in into the trees and lays the eggs. And then she has in her mandibles a pathogen called fusarium. And it's not like the it's a fusarium, but it's not the same as the palms get. But that fusarium is like a downy, cottony pathogen that becomes the food for her babies, for her larvae. So that fusarium and the insect cause a reaction and the tree will create that wet spot that you'll see. And the challenge is that there's no cure right now. This is a big problem because there's no cure. Um, there's both the insect you want to kill and the pathogen you want to suppress. So we're finding sycamore to be like the bellwether species. So I'm going to send a handout that has pictures of what you'll see so you can look at your trees and see if you're observing this. If you're observing it, then you can let the county know. And it's everywhere, unfortunately. It's really bad. Can you prevent it by doing something? Is there something that anybody prevent it? You know, it's challenging because the products, there's a systemic that can be used, but it can just kill the bug. I mean, is there something that you can do for your tree to it where it won't you know, want to attack it? Unfortunately, there's nothing you can do to prevent attacking. The tree likes healthy and non-healthy trees. It actually goes more towards healthy trees that are well hydrated, ironically. So, so there's only a treatment. So the challenge is that you can do a drench and a spray on the trunk, and then you can try to inhibit the tree from getting in. I mean, you can inhibit the insect from getting in the tree, or try to inhibit it from getting back out. But it's a resi has a very short shelf life, this product. The other one, uh, the other issue is the pathogen that it leaves behind. So researchers are literally just 24-7 researching this insect and trying, it's, it's changing monthly. And the host species list is, is expanding monthly. Like yes, it oak, sycamore, avocado. If you're saying there are hundred or many, many, many trees that that have this wet spot on it. So if we see trees with the wet spot, is that the red Well, flag? if you see this wet spot and it looks, I'm going to send you the handout so you can look and see. And it will be helpful. It's an electronic version of their big booklet. And you can just look through it on all the different species and what the telltale signs are. Um, yeah. But it's something to keep a lookout for, but it's it's on everybody's radar. Yeah. So any other questions? If it's in your yard, if you can do see it, do you need to get rid of that tree or can you well I mean so that's the some people can look at it like we have <laughs> those black ubers, they're so fancy. So, um, the, <laughs> the, um, the bug, if you see like 10 or 20 holes, they call that a low strike potential. There's a range that they have. And then they say, well, you can spray the trunk. You can have like a, a chemical company come out. They can spray it, they can treat it, you can try to slow it down. Um, if it has like 50 or more strikes, and you'll see it look like chicken pox all along it, like a sycamore, then that is very heavily attacked, and most likely the tree will die and succumb to it. Because it, what it does is it gets into the cambial tissue too, and it's going to shut off that flow of water. So I'm seeing these trees that are just dying, you know, with heavy attacks. I'm seeing a lot of it in Pasadena, Burbank, Los Feliz, all along this corridor here. Is it the temperature? Do they like a certain temperature? Good question. Um, they do like temperature to be about over 70 degrees. So you will, 
they say 68 to 70 is when they start to become active again. And because we had had five years where it was very moderate, they had a really hospitable environment. They're like, gosh, it's December or January or February, and they were getting able to come out of the tree because they don't want to come out of the tree until it's about 68 to 70 degrees. So now that it's consistently warm, they're going to be more active. And not to get into the, the weeds, so to speak, but they do like to stay on one tree. And the female will come out and then she'll attack another and lay more lit eggs and then she'll go elsewhere on the tree and attack more. So it's, it's really a problem. So something to be aware of because um, you may see a tree and not know what's going on. And you mentioned something about if you get rid of the actual bug, it leaves something behind. Yeah. No, you can't really get rid of the bug. You can't, you can't really, I mean these systemics may potentially kill the bug inside the tree, but they're not proven. And then the tree it has a residual, short residual. It, if you spray the trunk, it only lasts a month or two. Okay. And it starts to get very costly. Yeah. There should be a kind of a, a predator that, that, that attacks beetles. You're on it, man. They're trying to get a predator. Yeah. yeah it's, they're tiny, tiny, tiny. I mean, they're like the, side, the, like a, the end of a pen. Yeah. Tiny little bugs. Yeah, that's what they call a shot hole, like a little tiny shot hole bore. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, um, so now today you've learned a little primer on how to maintain your trees in extreme temperatures wind events, better pruning standards, and watering. So I hope that you take that knowledge, and I do always say, don't seek perfection. Like if you had to just throw some mulch down and get your hose out, you don't have time to get a soaker hose, don't worry about it. You're getting that leaching effect. Don't seek perfection. And then when it comes to pruning, if they prune something a little hard on one side or something, the tree will can handle a one-off. They can handle a one-time event. But now you know better management practices. So you guys can all implement those into the future of your trees. So I think that's it. Thank you. So if you've enjoyed this video, be sure to like it. And most importantly, by subscribing below, you'll be connected to this and all the other educational gardening videos. Thanks again for watching, and happy gardening.